Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, which you may, the sharp-eared listener, have realised is not in its usual location of studies and uh, offices and... We're on the river, aren't we, Jim? Yeah, we are. And, um, and you know, when you're talking about the history of London, that's where it's all at, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, and we're looking at a very famous ship. It's long. It's over 600 foot long. It's got fancy paint scheme all over it's it. scene of a billion school trips. I mean, and by the way, this is why there's helicopters and sirens and all, yeah, yeah, all, all, that, all, all that, that all background. That. Um, it's not a brilliant uh, audio effect put on by our producers. Um it's HMS Belfast. James, it's isn't HMS it? Belfast, um, which you know is is what a what a famous ship and and what incredible history it's got. And we're joined by Nigel and Robert of the Imperial War Museum, who are going to be guiding us around. But the first thing, obviously, is just to, is just to look at the look at that amazing camouflage scheme, which has got to be the coolest camo scheme ever, isn't it? Yeah, this is the um, dazzle camouflage scheme that um, Belfast was uh, painted in when she was refitted in 1942, um, following a major refit period designed to break up the ship's profile so that uh, German U-boats wouldn't quite be able to tell which direction or how fast she would have been um, sailing and thus their torpedoes would have um, sailed wide of the mark. Um, painted like this in time for the Arctic convoys up to um, oh. Soviet Russia, the um, period where the Royal Navy was escorting um, crucial supplies to the Soviet war machine in yep. their war against Nazi Germany. I, the, the, I mean, the thing I'm, all, I'm always struck by, you know, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, Battleship in London parked up. It's it, it's it's such a striking um, thing to see, isn't it? Yeah, it says it's a cruiser, not a battleship. I, well, this is it. So this is this is the thing. This is the thing I want to do before we go any, any further, further. What right? is a well, difference? well, well, well? Because because to the uninitiated, that's a battleship. Look, it's a it's a. It's, it's got guns. It's, it's got on the guns, surface. It's, it's got a big warship. guns on it. The pointy guns on it. It's painted in camouflage colours. It flies a white ensign. It's a ba- it's a battleship, Jim. Could we just carry on by calling it a battleship but it's not is it <laughs> no because because after all last week in uh in uh in in the war in ukraine a ship was uh, attacked and people were calling it a battleship and it and it wasn't was it it was an auxiliary it was an auxiliary vessel unloading stuff so what have we got what have we got here what's the difference and why and i know a lot of our listeners will know but you know land lovers like uninitiated. me i mean i could, I, could, I could tell you the difference between a center and a cromwell every day of the week but yeah but what have we got here so we have a what's uh, classed as a light cruiser here. So she, her main strengths are the power of her guns, but also her speed. Yeah. So right. Belfast is armed with six-inch guns. When I say six inches, that's the um, diameter, diameter of, the of the shell. Yeah. Um, which you know the, the, these thing, these shells weigh weigh about um, about fifty kilos. They're pretty hefty um, yep. ammunition, and that sounds pretty big, but the bigger battleships would have up 14, to 16. 16 inch shells, uh, yeah. vastly uh, larger. So, but still, well, you can see those outside um, the Imperial War Museum, can't you? Yeah, we've got two 15 inch guns uh, yeah. at Lambert. And they are massive. And I mean, they're, they're your size. <laughs> the shells, yeah. yeah. They, the, they're about, yeah, about five, six feet high. Exactly, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, well, closer to five. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like to tell myself anyway. And. and um, but it was the ship's speed as well, so she could do up to 32 knots. Uh, yeah, that's going on, isn't it? Um, um, the payoff on that, though, was light, light armour, only yep. four-inch belt armour around the sides. So it was um, the speed to catch up, take out smaller ships, or to run when faced with a. So this is, the, I mean, this is the, actually the old, bigger opponent. the old equation, isn't it? Which is which is firepower, speed. Armament. That's it. Um, yeah. With, same with, issue with tanks. Isn't same it? issue with tanks. With any, with basically, with any gun platform, it's, it's, that's your, that's your, 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 your trifecta that you've got. That you've, if you, if you want one, you're going to sacrifice the others. That's it. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. So it's got. Is it? What's it got? Got twelve six-inch guns. Twelve six-inch guns. And then an absolute plethora of anti-aircraft guns, and cannons. Yeah, um, we've got uh, eight four-inch guns, uh, 12 Bofors anti-aircraft guns, um, and that's just as the um, the ship appears in its uh, latest iteration when it was decommissioned in the 1960s. Um, 
the um, over the period of its 25-year service history, it was rebuilt, refitted um, numerous times, always upgrading and um, improving the uh, armaments uh, on board. So, for example, originally, um, when she was first uh, launched and commissioned, she would have had uh, torpedo tubes on each side, mm. roughly where we can see where those bins are now. Right. Yep. And um, uh, those were only only in use for a little while, but um, just it just shows how the ship was adapted uh, over time to uh, meet the needs. But 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 the point is is that that you know when you're building a ship, you know. It's, even a light cruiser, you know, and obviously it's much smaller than a battleship or an aircraft carrier, for example, but, but, but even a light cruiser is a huge investment. It's investment in terms of materials, investment in terms of time, obviously cost as well. So if you're going to build it in 1938, then you might as well make sure that it, it goes a distance and it can last a good long time and, and has that capacity to be updated. Yeah, exactly. Um, so even in its first few years of service during the Second World War, um, for example, electronic warfare technology um, was coming on apace. And um, with in time for its first major, major refit by 1942, um, she was fitted out with all of the latest um, radar-guided gunnery, um, dispensing with the need for the war spotter planes, which were no right. longer necessary yeah, yeah, from, of course, yeah. from then onwards. Um, uh, although Bad the, news for Supermarine, but great for <laughs> naval security. Definitely. But the hangars were still there, and then they had um, other uses. Um, and, um, yeah, then, you know, in the post-war period into the Cold War, the... Um, depending on the naval economics at the time and the prospect of the you know the growing threat from the, the Soviet Navy the ship was then seriously upgraded in the late 1950s into the configuration that we'd uh, see her in today with the new boxier forward superstructure the Bofors anti-aircraft guns the more spindly latticework um, masts to you know fit more radar equipment on top and um, <coughs> So that meant that, you know, a, a ship, as you said, that had been built in 1938 was still um, a serious piece of kit by the early 1960s when we're talking about supercarriers with jet aircraft. Yeah, we all know the massive advances technologically alone in the Second World War and then, and then the, the, you know, the arms race of the Cold War that, that delivers a whole new set of, of, of stuff. Uh, uh, Nigel, how did, the, how did the museum, how did the Imperial War Museum come by? Because this isn't like... This is not like a you know a Gate Garden spit, Guardian Spitfire, is it? This is not like um, pulling an old uh, Cromwell off a range, off a range where it's full of holes and you patch them up. This is, I mean, it's a great big bloody ship. It, it, it was quite a, it's quite a complicated story. And it takes place over many years, and I think one of the reasons that Belfast is the ship that we now preserve to tell the story of the Royal Navy is the fact, as, as we were just saying, it changed through the ages and it had this extra lease of life, really, from 1959 through to 1962. And that's one of the reasons why, then in the 60s, it was still being used as, as a reserve ship. And Imperial War Museum went down to Portsmouth in 1967 trying to get a six-inch turret. Uh, and it found that the, the turret it was looking at was in complete disrepair. But it went for lunch in HMS Belfast, which was still in operation. Uh, and as a result of a rather boozy lunch, drinking lots of pink gin, the historians got to the end and said, well, let's not take the ship, uh, let, let's take the whole ship, let's not just take the gun. And Brilliant. so it was one of these ideas that they then went away, did a feasibility study, and came up with the idea of preserving the ship. But even then, the government said, no, we're not giving you any more money, you can't have it. And it wasn't until 1971, when the ship was announced for scrapping, that the last operational captain, who by then was Rear Admiral Sir Morgan Morgan Giles, um, who had captained the ship 1961-62, was, he was a Conservative MP. He managed to put down an early day motion in Parliament to stop the ship from being scrapped. They got a three month stay of execution. During that time, he formed a private trust, raised enough money to preserve the ship, went back to government and said, hey, I can take this ship now, I've got the money, here it is. And they had to say yes. And so Belfast was preserved by a private trust with the help of the Imperial War Museum, brought up to the, to the Thames, moored in the position you find it today in 1971. And it wasn't until 78 it became a full part of the Imperial War Museum. 
but the story is one of those ones of pure serendipity yeah but filled full of powerful characters and powerful history which Gosh, that's a good brings story, that's a great isn't it? story that's isn't a great it? story a chap making it happen yeah, yeah no, that's absolutely what it was. incredible so well so let's let's go on to chips you say 1971 we've 25 years at sea on the walkway here um up to the gantry to, to go on on board and it starts with London, London, 1971, which is when she when she was yeah. uh, towed into here, and then and then what have we got? Trinidad, 1962. Is this so bear this? pigs? No, no. She will go to Trinidad on the way back. She does a fantastic road just as she comes back to go to the home fleet. Um, March through to June 62. She does this amazing voyage eastwards across the Pacific through the Panama Canal and then the Atlantic. Trinidad is the last stop on the Atlantic. Right. San Francisco is where she stops on the west coast of the United States. Dar es Salaam is where the ship goes for the independence celebrations of Tanganyika. Singapore, it was one of the home bases for Belfast. It was yeah. based in the Pacific Fleet from 1945 for the rest of its service, so up to 62. Kure, again, Japan, Belfast is in and out of Japan. Hong yeah. Kong was the other one with Singapore of its home bases out in the Far East. Yeah. Sydney is where it, it arrives just as the war against Japan is ending and it becomes another of these very familiar ports it's in and out of. And we begin with Belfast itself, which of course is where the ship is built. Is it Harland and Wolf? Harland Wolf. It's built there in 1938. And one of the things about HMS Belfast is always said to have the luck of the Irish. Only one <laughs> member of the ship's company died within the ship, uh, leading steward Lao So uh, in August 1952. Uh, the only member of the ship's company dies in the ship. Others died when they left the, the lucky barrier of the ship. Wow. That's that's, um, that's some stat actually. So 19- I mean, we were just earlier talking about infantrymen, just yeah. basically saying that if you if you're an infantryman in the Second World War, your chances of getting through unscathed were zero. Yeah, clearly they all needed to be on Belfast. Didn't so they? so um, 1938, people might think, well, it's appeasement. Um, why are they building um, uh, light cruisers in 1938? What's going on? This is is this part of a, a big shipbuilding drive that's going on? Or do they build half a dozen of these, or is she unique? Belfast is really comes into the, it's, it's, it's the third of the town class cruises. It, it, it basically comes in response to the Japanese breaking the arms limitation treaties, which have governed the size of fleets since the, the end of the First World War. Yeah. And so it's quite interesting that HMS Belfast goes into operation in the war against Germany, but really is brought into being as a result of a reaction against concern about the growing size of the Japanese fleet and then the American fleet in the mid-1930s. And so Belfast becomes this super cruiser, a kind of enhanced cruiser status because of a reaction to the ships that these other nations are building. So, so it's, it, it, although we think of her in terms of the war in Europe, Arctic convoys, and all that. This is a, this is to deal with a completely different. Because after all, we tend to focus, or people tend to focus, on appeasement, Germany, what's happening in Europe. But in fact, actually, the British Empire is playing another, uh, you know, global game at the same time, isn't it? And yeah. I mean, the, the the great fear in the mid 1930s is there's going to be a war simultaneously against Germany, yeah. Italy, and Japan, all of whom have got naval cap- capacity, and the British fleet will not be able to match the combined capacity. And when that comes into being by 1941, the fleet is fully stretched. Yeah. Yes, because because during appeasement there is this, I mean, you know, and from the mid 1930s onwards, it's 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 the navy and the RAF that gets the lion's share of defence budget, isn't it? Yes, uh, but I mean, well, and, and, but even quite then right too. Even then, it's not enough. No, of course not. It never is, is it? But, exactly. <laughs> but they're constantly looking at the how you can build new ships, which is obviously a very slow process. It takes a while to conceive them, design them, build them, lay them down, and then develop a class of ships. And so it's not a quick process. But you no, can of see course, this no, beginning from the mid-1930s onwards, um, as they, the British are bound and, and play quite fairly by the naval treaties. Um, and, but as other nations diverge from that, they have to match. Well, the, the, they're bound by the treaties because it's saving them money. It's the, you, know, do, you don't want to have to build... Uh, uh, expensive ships and uh, uh, and do that outlay. You, that's why you want people to respect the treaty. Now we talked about the guns earlier on. This six-inch gun. What, what, how far off its target does um, uh, uh, off her to her? I'm going to not use the word it the whole time on this on the ship if I can possibly help it. How far off? What are the range of these guns? How far? How far off? Say uh, she's been sent to sh- shell Dieppe. How far off does she have to stand? You, you, the, the range of the six-inch guns is about 14 miles. We can do up to 14 miles. Wow. So where we're moored here, 
we've always traditionally said that the, the front turret has the guns ranged uh, as if it's going to the South Mim service station on the M1. <laughs> so, so it can it well, kind of gives you some idea. A favor, that, it? That from this position between Tower Bridge and London Bridge, you can shoot out of range of the M25. Yeah, it kind so of gives you some idea. And, Heathrow, and in, uh, Heathrow's yeah, kind of he, in range. Yeah, he, Heathrow would just about be at the upper end of the range. Yeah, me. And it's quite a thing, isn't in, it? In Normandy. Uh, it remains off the Normandy coast for five weeks. Yep. And it's only really when they move into Caen, uh, well away from the shore, that Belfast guns lose their ability to affect the outcome. Yeah, because, I mean, the, the shooting with um, na uh, uh, naval guns in, the, in, in those first five weeks is incredibly effective, isn't it? And, yeah. Uh, and the Germans, yeah, holding to, the Germans holding to the coast exposes them to this sort of firepower, rather than 25 pounders and mediums and heavies, you know, on land. Which yes, are but it's, but it's also it. why it takes a bit of time to kind of organise all these yeah. things, because you've got, you know, you obviously you've got forward liaison officers radioing back to there. That, that's got to be coordinated with land operations, air operations. You know, it's a tri-service battle Normandy, yeah. isn't it, for quite well, a... Yes, I mean... Certainly, the, certainly parachute, the second week of July. Parachute trained foos going in with 6 yeah. Airborne on the night of D-Day. Right. Know, who, who, who naval guys and... Uh, anyway, the, it's the guns I... I mean, to be honest, we've been... When, we, when I read the ship, the C.S. Forrester um, book, the year before last, in the mid of, middle, middle of the pandemic, we did some audio books. And C.S. Forrester, he seems obsessed with the gun loading systems in this... It, mm. it, 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 and he does it brilliantly, he doesn't does it he? Brilliantly. The mechanised gun loading, the way these six-inch guns or these equip, these kind of gun systems worked during the Second World War. So can we go and look at that, please? Yeah, and, and the other thing, one of the things that we did during... Whilst we were closed for most of the pandemic uh, and we, we brought in a whole lot of new kind of visitor experiences. And one of them is the gun turret, where we tried to give some impression and feel of what it was like being in the middle, so we could go and see if we could check yes, out one Yes, please. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. Shipsy says it's all missiles. It's not like, yeah, you know, I mean, when was the it? last time, when was the last time naval gunnery like this was, was used in, was it the first Gulf War? Oh, the Missouri War? was being the used Missouri in the Gulf War, wasn't first, it? Yeah. First Gulf War, wasn't it? So 30 years ago. So, so this is ancient tech now. I read, I read a paper not that long ago saying there was a case for bringing back battleships. Yep. Yeah, I mean, but... I mean, not, not serious, but the fact that it, you know... <laughs> It, is, it does make you wonder, though, how, for example, the Falklands War may have gone had HMS Vanguard still been in service at that yeah. point. Mm. Um, yes, I mean, well, I mean, the attack on Goose Green, there's, there's one three-and-a-half-inch gun, isn't there, that, the, that, that jams and that, yeah. that the Navy can bring to bear on the battlefield, and it turns into a pure infantry battlefield, doesn't it, uh, as a result? Yeah. 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 We're going to take a quick break. When, when we come back, we'll be um, uh, looking at guns, won't we, Jim? Yeah. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Make You Talk um, on HMS Belfast. I'm looking back towards Tower Bridge, Tower London's behind Jim's uh, right shoulder. And we're talking to the curator, Rob. We're standing on the aft deck here. On, on the quarter deck. The quarter deck. At the, uh, yeah, at the stern or aft of the ship. You see, yes. There we go. You see? Um, it's you, you see, you do, uh, this, this, do you do nautical speak, Jim? Do you use a little bit? A little bit. I, no, I want to. I want to know port. more. Oh, I, mean, on, I, I spent after reading the ship and um, the Good Shepherd or whatever it was. I, I spent a lot of time going very port. well. Starboard. You, you, you do port starboard. Oh, I do port that, starboard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, important yeah, thing. Right. So we're. But, we're but, but the, this is this 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 after deck is important for, important for me personally. Court. Or the after deck, right? Um, it's the quarter deck. It's the quarter deck. Yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right, okay. Well, you just chomp me on that one. It's in the aft. Anyway, we're in the aft. We're in the aft of the quarter deck. Anyway, this quarter deck uh, beneath the the three six inch the quarter deck six inch. What would you go? So what turret is this one called? So that would be. Um, this is going to write. That's yeah. Y turret. So okay, Y turret. Yeah, because they're given they're given letters, aren't they? That's YX it. and all YX that, and A and B at the yeah. at the bow. Yep. So under Y was when my first ever history book about the siege of Malta. We had a little launch party here and we had a photograph with all the veterans underneath these guns. Uh, and amongst them was Tubby Crawford of, of oh, wow. Upholder and Unseen. Um, we had Freddie Treves, who yep. he was on the Weimarana um, on Operation Pedestal when it sunk within three minutes. Um, we had uh, Mimi Cortis, who had been a Maltese nurse up at Imtafa. Yep. Um, Frank Ricks and loads of people. It was, it was just a very, very memorable day. And, and weirdly, I just saw that photograph yesterday because it's still on our fridge. Yeah. On a fridge magnet. And, you know, not a single one of them is alive now. It's so sad. But mm. 
So, so th this turret boasting three six-inch guns. This is all fully automated and mechanised, is it? It's engines. It's, it's it's not man-powered in any sense. Um, it, it it can be both. So right. it would have been operated by. Um, steam-driven electrical generators, because right. remember, we're essentially on a steamship here yeah. still. Um, um, we'll, I'm sure we'll see them in a bit, but we've got uh, steam boilers below deck, which... Um, oil-fired, right? Oil, yeah, oil-fired, um, and they power electrical generators, which then power the, the laying of the guns, the rotation of the turret. But should any of those systems fail, Royal Navy ships always have at least two backups. So, firstly, you'd have had spare generators for if the primary ones had failed. And if there was a complete electrical failure, you could operate all of this by hand um, right. at a push as well. And, so. they'd, and be, they'd be well versed and well practiced in those emergency procedures and all that sort of thing. Oh, Super de drilled. De definitely. The, the turret crews, the um, ordnance artificers, the um, turret engineers would have been training on that all the time so that they were capable in it, you know, in any situation of um, maintaining the rate of fire because to, to the gunners in those turrets, they, they referred to it as uh, feeding the beast. The only thing they were there to do were to feed those shells into those guns yeah. and keep firing until the order came to stop. So, uh, and, and how many men are in, the, in, in Y turret then? Okay, you'd have had 27 men up there, so three... Uh, three six-inch guns with a crew of seven each, so we're up to 21. You'd have then had six in the turret crew themselves, maintaining and operating the turret itself. Yep. Um, and finally, a, um, a turret commander. So a gunnery officer who's, a gunnery in, officer, who's yeah. in charge. Um, was that a lieutenant? Uh, or uh, it could have been, but it, sometimes it was also a senior rates like a chief petty officer right well. okay right okay so an nco essentially right yes yeah. um, um, and uh what's the rate of fire what what are they, when you say they're feeding the beast what's the what, what's the beast capable of a great of? line isn't it yeah. Yeah. What, yeah one of my um one of my old colleagues on 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 belfast who served in the royal navy um for about 30 years he was a gunner and that's how he yeah. described uh, uh his work during that time but um yeah the rate of fire could have been um up to, you know, when they're working like clockwork at full speed, um, firing in eight shells out of each gun per minute. So if you then times that by three for each turret. Um, 24 six inch guns going 14 miles a minute. My God. Times four. My God. That's nearly 100, isn't it? That, that's a kind of nominal rate. I think unsustainable for any length yes, of time. Yes, of course, yeah. But, but, it's simply because you'd run out of shells as much as anything else. But, yeah, so what, but, but in principle, that's, that's the speed. If you need to do, you do a, a really heavy barrage, then you can do it. Sticking a stonk on something. I mean, yeah. uh, and what is the magazine capacity? <laughs> uh, that's too too big a question of a number for me to carry in my head. All right, uh, okay, but, well, no, you know, I'm sorry security no, question. No, I can't no, possibly Numbers fall that. out of my head. <laughs> right. but, but they can bring it up. Obviously, they have three hoists all working to service the guns. So they can sustain it for as long as they've got the reserves. And so right. they will then have to go back. And this is why there's constant... You, you do a few days of uh, kind of tour off, say, yeah. off the Korean coast. Then you have to go back to Japan to refit. To refit. Because you've got to refit and re, uh, kind of refill your ammunition supply yeah. and, and the, obviously the, the danger at firing uh, keeping up that rate of fire are you know the, the, these guns, the guns and, get yeah. too hot you're yeah. putting live ammunition into hot guns the risk of an accident increases so you could you could sustain that for a uh, a minute or two, yeah. um, uh, but then you'd need to uh, conserve the ammunition, uh, cool the guns down. And the men, I suppose, would be run ragged in, in uh, you know, be exhausted by uh, the maintaining men, that rather rate. Rather than the, the kind of rate at which they're firing, I think the main thing when you're on board is to think about is a broadside, which is all 12 guns going off simultaneously. Mm. And that's one massive, powerful explosion, effectively. Yeah. Oh, and, shit and rocks. So, I mean, there's the apocryphal stories from D-Day that the force of that explosion cracked all the toilets. So it's, it's, it's that kind of power. And the last time that was done was in the kind of September, October of 1962 in a training exercise down off um, on the edge of the Atlantic when Belfast was in home waters only, back for the home fleet. But so the size and power 
of a 12 gun broadside firing at one time is something that it's almost inconceivable I think even when you're looking at it, particularly when you're looking at a nice calm sunny day like this yeah to think of the extent of that violence but it, it's that's the power <coughs> that a ship like this could deliver well and you to, and, and earlier you said there are ships with much bigger guns that we we're, we're, we're talking about these six inch guns and there's there's 14 inch yeah. you know all, all sorts of uh, other d diabolical means of delivering uh, firepower to the enemy um Shall we, can, we, so can we go and have a look? We're now inside Y turret, which is the aftmost turret on Belfast. I'm, I'm enjoying being able to stand up straight, which is unusual in my yeah. experience of going on old naval vessels. It's normally I'm banging my head or something or grazing my, grazing my forehead. Great smell as well, isn't there? Of yeah. Sort of metal and oil and But, but you've got to remember rubber. too that there's five of us here today. So you had another 22. It's getting a bit crowded, and you don't have. You, you might have headroom, but you're not going to have a great deal of room. Uh, of, no, not much wiggle room. And so, so you can see the the three guns here in front of you. Yep. Yep. Each of these has a, a crew of seven, as Rob said, and they all have a specific job to do. And when you see the firing of the gun, to me, it's a bit like say synchronized swimming. Yeah. Where everybody's moving in a team. It's like a dance routine. And they used to practice out on the deck, chalked out on the deck, so that they all knew exactly what the job was. Because Amazing. everything went in literally a mechanical pattern and they become part of a mechanism like a clock. It's like a tick, 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 uh, tick, tick, ticking over. And were they trying to do each other's jobs or were they all no, just... No, they each had a specific job and your job was to focus only on your job and to be ready at exactly the moment you needed. If you wanted to hit that rate of eight shells a minute, everything has to be perfectly choreographed and synchronized. Or if you want to fire broadside with everything fired You have to have everything ready and yeah. then it has to be leveled and there's, there's setting the guns, there's filling the gun, there's, there's, all of those processes have to be ready and completed at exactly the right moment or you're going to hold it up or you're going to get it wrong. Yeah, I mean, what we're looking at here, we're looking at the, you can see the breaches of three guns there, they're two a bit further forward than the, the center one. There's tubes going everywhere, coming out of sort of magazine lifts where the shells presumably pop up and then roll down, not roll down, but they slide can then be down. slide down or they get, there's, a, there's a sort of, you can see the little wheels which enables them to kind of roll down into a, into a, a sort of cup, a sort of lozenge shaped yeah. catcher, which obviously lifts and falls and so it, the shell is literally pushed into the breech, isn't it, mechanically? Yeah, the, the, the hoist, which is at the, right at hoist, the front. Hoist, that's a word. After, it comes up on the hoist in such a way that it then comes, end of the shell backwards, it slides down the loading tray. The loading tray can then be moved over to match the breech. And at that point, you then have a rammer who rams home the shell. And there's two of them, one faces and one faces backwards. Um, you then have a cordite charge, and you can see the cordite coming through a separate right. hoist. Yep. Now, the cordite is kept separate because of its volatility. It's extremely dangerous, can easily explode. It comes up in a cardboard tube, like a giant toilet roll, um, and it's a silk bag. And so someone would pick it up, put it on their shoulder, and they would then tip it onto the tray. The tray would then get pushed in behind before you can close the breech. And you can see behind us there's a little hatch in the rear of the turret, and that's where you would chuck out all of these cardboard hoists. And so at the end of a battle or an action, you would see a whole pile of giant toilet rolls standing outside each turret, because that was them getting rid of the debris. So Otherwise, it's, it would it's just a cartridge-less charge. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, right. it's, it's, okay. a, it's a silk bag. A uh, uh, silk bag, and, and different charges different regarding to Different Defense. shoots. So if you're firing, if you're not firing so far, you don't need to. The, 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 the charge, right? standard charge, different shell. Right. The right. projectile. Okay. Right. So and they will then load, the, 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 close the breech. The gun will then get laid, and it will be ready to fire. So that process, each of the seven men would go through that rotation to make sure that the guns, one after another, would get brought back in, and that would be happening all three guns simultaneously. Right. And if you so, if they can do that eight times in a minute. They've got that down reflexively to sort of under 10, un, under 10 seconds. That, yeah. I, the I mean, shell arriving to being loaded to being fired. The, the hoists are moving constantly. That's going some, Rotating isn't it? all the way around. You can see that we, we have a diagram to try and explain to people how they all come through yeah. in a different way. It just rotates. It's basically like a dumb way to lift. It just yeah. carries it up. And by the time it gets here, it's then facing the right direction. It flips back. But through a series of blast through blast proof doors and uh, uh, sort of there's ways of 
cutting the magazine off, isn't there? And, and the turrets off from each other. They're, they're on different decks. And so the, the magazine where the cordite is stored um, is down right in the bottom of the ship. Um, the, the shell room where the projectiles are kept, the deck above that, and they have independent and separate hoists. So they come up separately. Right. And so they come out in different places. So the, the cordite is re near the rear. The, the projectiles themselves come up through the top, come down the trays. So, so is there someone in the magazine putting stuff on the, yeah. on the load, on the hoist, as it were, on, on the, into the system? Yeah, so we're currently standing on top of what's essentially a giant steel tube with the, the turret sitting on top and then the hoists and the shell and cordite magazines all located um, directly below us. Uh, so you'd have had 45 men in total working in that entire cylinder yeah provide um loading wow. the shells into the into the hoists uh, constantly um there's like a, a turntable at the bottom so you'd have had um, um sailors loading the shells from the racks into the turntable and then those would have been um popped straight into the hoist by another sailor um later ships in the second world war certainly bigger ones with the the 14 16 inch um, shells that was all mechanized because they were too big and too heavy yeah but for belfast with the six inch um, shells a, a man can the man manageable lift, can, can lift them so it's uh, does the whole thing revolve all the way down or at what point does it stop revolving so so you're looking at four we're looking at four mm. stories or five stories in this you should say this is a this, cutaway diagram it's isn't a cutaway it? diagram and, and and there's all these layers and we're in the top bit you are here and there's does the entire thing turn with the turret uh, no just the turret itself at the top is um is uh, on the on the wheels that um that r rotates but, the but, the, but, but presumably this has to rotate as well doesn't it and that's it yeah exactly that the, the hoist um, rotates with the turntable at the, at the base bottom. so the cylinder itself is um oh we can go into solid. this can't we yeah, we can yeah, go we'll and see this yeah the next, next so, yeah. so my big question for you is, is is i've always been rather obsessed by you, you know whenever i've been to long sumer you you one of the guns i can't remember is two or three you can see where the where the uh, armor plate around the protecting the front of the gun, this is the German Kriegsmarine coastal gun, has been hit and there's a sort of lozenge-shaped groove in the breech where a shell from HMS Ajax, which is obviously a cruiser, has hit it on D-Day. And this has been fired from about six miles out at sea. So let's just imagine that we're in, you know, wide turret of HMS Ajax on D-Day. What is the process by which you get a shell going six miles to hit something that accurately. Well, the, I, want, I want the whole process from sort of start to finish. It's, it's, it's an amazing feat of um, skill, gunnery, training, right? engine, uh, training and, and gunnery. So uh, a, a warship like um, Belfast or, or Ajax for that matter would have had two sorts of fire. There would have been direct fire, which is at you can sea, see it, where you can see it on the horizon, and indirect fire, principally at a target on land where you'd have um, hills and other relief um, in the way. So for direct fire, you'd have on top of the superstructure, mm. the gunnery control tower, which is a big rotating um, collection of um, in instruments. Um, and, ju and just for the uninitiated, the superstructure is a bit on top of the deck, which is sort of added, sort of buildings, structures, that, that's whatever. It's, it's, it's all Super, i.e. above structure. The structure that all points up above, yep. the, uh, above the deck. <laughs> and, and right on the top of that, where, where the sailors up there would have had the best view, um, with all the viewing equipment, um, they could um, measure up the range of the target and input um, data into fairly crude analog data measuring systems essentially which would then all get crunched in a great big analog computer so you would say okay we're this far off the off the coast we've got our, our maps and we know where this gun this enemy gun coastal gun position is so we know where we've got to hit it to yeah and all of all of the, the range the and if it's say a moving target at sea uh, if the ship itself um, that you're firing from was moving all that data would be put into the um, uh, the analog computer, the, the, which is known as the director control table, and the right numbers would come out at the end of that to the turret crews and the gun layers. So that so would say, this is the elevation you need to be. Exactly. This is, yep. a, this is a, the absolute angle you need to be. 
and that and would fire. be and that would be changing constantly as the target moves. So okay, but say it's, say it's a fixed target like this yep. this this coastal gun position at Long Sumer. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah. I right. just I just wanted to step in so, and say. So the ship is moving. It's not yeah, just you, us. No, no, you because you you. you constantly got to adjust and take into account right. the movement of the position even if it's just rippling water right. backwards and forwards and, and so so that's what the control table does is it, it plots that and puts in all the different parameters so it's got gyros and stuff and it's reading reading the movement yeah, it, of the boat it, it, when you go to the table it, it's got uh, various there's about nine marines sit around the table right. and they put it all in and, and they basically punch out a final and that changes every round does it yeah it will change round by round to keep it on the same place and so it will constantly updating to give a different range and bearing for each of the guns and they can be fed directly by the gunnery officer or they can be given manually to each of the gun crew but but how do they know if they've hit it or not if they can't see it they won't know they, they need some observation that that's why you will then have the coordination say with the spotter aircraft on the shore if you're ah. firing six miles away you won't have the height to be able to see your target. So but the guy in the spotter area is on, is on the radio, going radioing back yeah, left to right, left to right. Each ship is, is paired tied with an individual spotter aircraft, which will go and feed back um, so that they can adjust the target and bring it back onto, onto the range. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, Bert? Because, you know, you know, over the years, the, the British war efforts had come with its fair share of criticism, and, and I suppose especially the army. The Navy doesn't, no one really sort of really comments about it and is that just because it's just assumed that the the skill levels of the Royal Navy are going to be so good but I mean you know it's seamanship whether it's seamanship whether it's clearing mines ahead of the D-Day invasion force or whether it's gunnery I mean it's it's an amazing organisation by that stage of the war isn't it I mean it is in 1939 to be fair yeah, and, and many of the, the the roles the jobs that the the ship's company for at all levels have to carry out are incredibly technical and I think that's one of the things, um, e even in the old days, when you stokers literally stoked the boilers with shovelfuls of coal, that required a brute force. But stokers became highly skilled individuals because yes. you became boiler te uh, technicians. Yes, you had of to course. know about uh, oil fired. You had to know about bringing in the right level of fuel. You had to know about combustion levels. And so being a stoker was no longer simply having a shovel and bringing in coal. It becomes a very sophisticated thing right. as oil-fired boilers take over from coal-fired boilers. So that throughout the Royal Navy, everybody's role is very technical and it requires a degree, a high degree of initiative. So, uh, so Nigel, what, what, sorry, uh, what, what, what's, what's an, because I know what a stoker is, but what's an engine artificier? An artificer is, is somebody artificer. who is, okay. is like a senior role mechanic. Their job is to sit above everybody else to make sure that whatever they are responsible for and you can have it's, it's like a technical uh foreman you're you're the senior level it's a bit like being uh sergeant major you're in charge of the team um that then looks after it so you can do it for engineering you can do it for carpentry so you can be an artificer who is responsible for woodwork and so it's basically a technical green and each um, member of this um, would have had an engineering room artificer in it and they would have been responsible for the teams of people who maintained all the guns. Because if, if, if you got there on the 6th of June and found that one of the guns was broken, that's the ERA's fault. Right. Um, I will, uh, to get away from the sort of technical side, I want to know what it was like in here physically when you're firing the guns. Um, are you wearing like a heavy wool flash proof suit? and you're wearing like the whites and stuff, uh, what, are they, what are they wearing? And then what's being done to protect them from the noise? Because, um, you know, you think about uh, the, the Ajax uh, procurement cock up that's going on at the moment, where the, 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 that armored personnel carrier is too noisy to have soldiers in it, it makes them poorly. Um, I have a feeling the Second World War places being noisy that might make you ill isn't really a thing on anyone's um, no, that, uh, radar, that, that, so to speak. That wasn't such a, an issue in, in, in a turret like this. So yeah, to answer your first question, uh, at action stations, the sailors uh, in the turret would have been in their horizon blue coloured boiler suits, right. um, anti-flash hoods, anti-flash mittens. Um, wouldn't have needed a steel helmet in here because you, you're, in, you're inside, but the um, chief petty officer for point of um, uh, rank might have still had his 
peaked cap on over right. his anti-flash hood um, so that um, there was some rudimentary fireproofing should there be um, should there be a fire or a, yeah. an explosion it certainly would have been very loud in here the um, but mostly through the concussion of the explosions in the breaches going through the steel you, you'd have felt it in your chest in your feet um, the sheer yeah, force in the, the sheer room. force of it. Right. The, the, most of the bang goes out of the other end. Yeah, out yeah, of the because yeah. um, yes, uh, sound muscle. is, is yeah. gas moving anyway. Yeah. Whereas, whereas this is so that so it's the violence of the of the of the explosions going through the actual. That's it, it, it itself. It, exactly. Oh, so wow. it would have been very loud, but a different, different loudness loud. that goes through your entire body. That the can kind that would bones, sort of yeah. shake out. Um, you know, if you've got gold stones in your gallbladder they get shaken out <laughs> <laughs> and what about gases and smoke and all that kind of stuff but you've also got the noise of the hoists so yeah. the hoists are like a constant chain churning going and then you've got six of those going you've got them bringing up the, the cordite you've got them bringing up the, the projectiles for three guns so that's a constant noise that's going on all the time that you want your shells obviously if you stop firing the hoists Sorry, stop. stop so is you that like a up. high whine or, uh, no, like I think mechanical. it's like a grinding chunk Right. that goes on rather than the high wine. Right, right. They, 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 they're going bang, steadily bang, rather yeah, yeah. than speedily. But right. as you say, that the, the atmosphere would soon become pretty rank because you get all these people working, they'd build up a heat, yep. uh, there'd be sweating. gases going off. Um, well, there wouldn't be smoke in here. There, 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 there would be the well, kind of when you the build up breach. of a fog rather than yes, the smoke. What do you get when you open a breach and, and you fired the weapon? Does, did you get gas coming back down or is it all gone? Has all the, all the cordite been expended through the end of the barrel? I would always assume that there would be an exchange of gases as you open the breach, and at yeah. that point there may be some kind of element which you visible in the air. There will be a gas coming out yeah. still, even if it's a stale air. And so that sort of thing is all building up collectively within the turret. And so they become difficult places to work, but the people wouldn't have noticed it a great deal because they were entirely focused, so focused on what on they were tasks, doing. Yeah. Their job was to stay alert and be ready to do their part of the job. And, and I mean, I mean, I expect there isn't an answer to this, but 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 how long could you be on the on the guns, and at what point would you be relieved or rotated? Are there are there auxiliary gun crews? I mean, how how does it work if you're on a really really long shoot? You know, if you if your action if, stations are your action stations. Uh, and you would stay there for the duration of the action until you were stood down from action stations. Everybody had one job and you went straight to it. So the, 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 the cooks um, would have been deployed down often, say, to the magazines. Yeah. So all of a sudden, when you go to action stations, uh, if you're working in one of the galleys, uh, you'd shed your kit, you'd go downstairs, and basically your underpants and no shoes or a pair of pumps at the very most, because nothing which could create a spark, you'd be down, closed in, um, at action stations for as long as it went and you had no idea how long it was actually going to last and that's why he was saying it's the intense moments of bombardment can only be sustained yeah. for short periods of time yeah but you when you were at your action stations and everything was closed down you were basically on your own and it was down to you and that's where it varies often with some of the other services in the royal navy it was down to you and you had a local responsibility and there's a great story during the battle of north cape of a sailor called larry fursland um, and larry fursland was in charge of one of the generators generating the electricity which turned the turret and so Larry Fursland knew that his generator was essential it, during this battle in which Belfast was engaged with the Scharnhorst, that his turrets kept working. And very soon into the battle, when one of the broadsides went off, Fursland's cooling system Mike. failed. What he did was he took the fire hose with salt water, he plugged it in, he forced a connection, and he got the water circulating again. So his generator stayed cool. And as a result of that, kept working throughout the Battle of North Cape and the turrets kept working. And for a result of that, he got a Distinguished Service Medal. But that was down to Larry Fursland, who knew it all depended on him. Now we're out the turret, I, there's one thing I just want to say um, that, that's really striking me, is this is, I mean, these ships are powder kegs, aren't they? They're, they're, um, they're, they're full of explosive. I mean, you, you, if a turret takes a direct hit, it's full, it's, you know, what's to stop the whole ship going up? How is that, is that done? So the ship is separated into armoured compartments, which um, at various stages of action stations are um, locked down, that the hatches are locked and closed um, to, pre to 
create fire breaks basically right. um, within the structure of the ship. So, for example, the, the turret where we are now, I mentioned we're standing on top of a very, you know, very large steel cylinder, and that was perfectly designed that at action stations, all of the hatches would be closed down. The men working inside knew they were closed down. You know, yeah. that was something deep at the back of their minds, perhaps. But um, if the turret took a direct hit, which was enough, you know, by a, for example, the Shan Horse uh, at North Cape was firing 11 inch shells. Yeah. Um, if one of those directly hit one of these turrets, whole thing would go up. Yeah. But that's kept within the steel cylinder. Right. So the explosion would be directed up and away from the rest of the but ship. contained and... It's uh, contained gosh. then. Um, no hope at all for the 45 men no. working in the turret, but that saves the lives of the other 800 men okay. in the ship. It was one of the uh, clear lessons that we drew from the Battle of Jutland, yeah. where there were several Br British ships exploded instantly because of the spread of this flash fire where there wasn't the compartmentalization. Mm. And so from Jutland, we worked out that it was necessary to actually make sure that if a turret exploded, it stayed as a vertical explosion and it didn't spread sideways through the ship. The Germans had drawn the same lesson from Dogger Bank and already right. had started to compartmentalise their ships, which is one of the reasons why we lost so many more ships at Jutland than, yeah. than the Germans did. Yeah. But the, in Beatty's flagship, Major Harvey, Royal Marine, shut down his turret and stopped the ship from ripping apart and got a Victoria Cross for mm -hmm. putting, kind of saving it and restricting it to that one particular turret. Right. And so that's how here in this ship, you're at risk vertically, but not horizontally. As you can probably tell listening to this... It's feeling like a double bill, isn't it's it? It's turning into a double bill. Um, there's lots to talk about. So we will see you again on HMS Belfast next time.